So what I like to do is I like to kind of re-educate my students. I think there's been a lot of misinformation. If you've watched TVs, movies, read books, I think photography has mis been misrepresented by a lot of places. And a lot of people have a misconception about what they can do in photography. And so I want to kind of blow away some of these photographic myths so that we can start with a solid foundation and we don't have any clutter in where we're going to want to build your education. So let's get started with myth number one. I'll have a number of these. If I see something I like and I take a photograph of it, I'll get a good photograph. And I think you can probably calmly see here in, in your home or here in the, uh, the audience, the classroom, that, oh, well, of course that's not true. But it's what we base a lot of photographs on. When do you want to take a photograph? When you're excited, when you're feeling good. Listen, we take pictures at birthday parties and anniversaries, uh, get-togethers, picnics, things like that. We don't take pictures at funerals and times when we're getting fired from our job. Those aren't happy times. We want to remember the happy times, and we're often documenting things to remember the good moments in our life. And here's my photograph to explain the situation, perhaps visually. Okay, so we got Barack Obama here over on the left, and we have a bunch of people, especially dude in the middle here, who is super excited about being that close. And not only does he need to get a picture of Barack Obama, he's got to get in the picture himself with a big old grin on his face. But the thing that is interesting to note in this photograph is look at how many people have cameras. They're excited, they want to remember the moment, and so what do they do? They take a picture because it's the, it's the most tangible way to help remember the moment. But I can assure you that it doesn't always capture the moment the way you remember it. And you don't have to look any further than my personal photo album, which I am going to share with you now. It is filled with dozens, if not hundreds, of absolutely terrible photographs. This was done under the best of intentions by myself, and some pictures were taken by my father. I'm sorry to say. I hope he's not listening today. <laughs> um, but there are terrible photographs, but we took them for some reason. We were excited. At, at one point, this was my best photograph of Mount Rainier. Yes, that is Mount Rainier, that white clutter in the background. Uh, this, this is one of my dad's photographs. That's actually me. I'm in a bicycle race. And we could discuss the technical issues with this, but I think it's clear to say that the main problem is, is that I wasn't riding my bike fast enough. And as we look around at some other photographs, well, we may not want to talk about my athletic endeavors too much. But we all have photos like this in our photo album. And I want you to keep this in mind for, for later today. Uh, these, these terrible photographs that you can see were taken with the best of intentions. Um, we, we have thought that they were going to come out. I love this one here. I, I know there are so many pictures out in the world that are like this. There's a lot of them. And perhaps the best of the bad photographs is, is this one here. And the, the sad case is, um, is this is me. And these are my college buddies and friends that I hung out with. And the, the sad part, the sad behind-the-scenes story is that I was in college getting a degree in photography. And, and you set the shot up, didn't you? <laughs> and I set the shot yeah, up. Right. And this is what I got. And so uh, this, is, this is just, you know, to show you that even on, with the best of intentions, we can end up with terrible photographs. And, and I hope you see the, the guts that I have being a professional photographer coming out here and showing you this as my first collection of photographs. Uh, so let's, let's move on and, and step away from the back, bad photographs. Myth number two. Here we go. If I have better equipment, I'll be a better photographer. Now, I'm as much as a gadget geek as you're likely to find, and I totally understand how a new piece of gear can allow you into a whole new world perhaps expanding your capabilities. But if simply buying better equipment made you a great photographer, let me introduce you to possibly the best photographer in the world. Uh, having more gear will not solve the fundamental issues. You need to know your stuff. And kind of looking at some of those big lenses, one of the other things that I've noticed is with these big lenses, people always say, you must be able to photograph an eyelash from a mile away. And I can, I can tell you very truthfully, having worked with wildlife photographers like Art Wolf, 
who get out there in the, in the field, there, there's this misconception that wildlife photographers will sit up on a hillside with this really big, fancy, expensive lens, and they will shoot close-up portraits of wild animals like this. And I can assure you that is not the case. Usually, they are scarily close to the animals. Yes, that's a cameraman, and he's about 30 to 40 feet away from a grizzly bear. And that is what photographers need to do. They need to get very involved in their subject matter. Now, I know if you walk into a camera store, you read the, the camera magazines, you get the feeling that taking pictures is easy. And I'm sorry to say that it's not really true. There's an illusion that it's easy because all you do is you press a button and the picture is taken. And there's a lot more that goes into taking pictures than pressing a button, okay? In just some of the pictures that I've already shared with you, I could recount in a long story about the making of that photograph. Either it took me several days to get to that location, or it took hours and hours of planning, or it maybe took thousands of shots before I got one good shot that was good enough to share and that rose above the rest of everything else. I can assure you, photographers like Art Wolf and Chase are highly involved in what they do. It consumes their lives and they get closer to the events and more involved than most people give them credit for. And yes, every once in a while, you do get to stand up on a hillside with a fairly big telephoto lens and snap off some pretty pictures. But it's the exception, not the rule. All right, myth number five. I take great pictures. I've never taken a class. I'm completely self-taught, and my pictures are awesome. And you know, I don't care about shutter speeds and those aperture thingies. I just use a point and shoot and have a great eye. There's a lot of people that have had zero education in photography, and they are absolutely proud of it. And their pictures show it. You know, every once in a while they'll get a nice one, or they really don't like to compare theirs, those fo their photographs with everyone else's. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that if you want to be a good photographer, you've got to get down and dirty, and you've got to learn the fundamentals, and that's what this class is about. We will get in to apertures, shutter speeds, ISOs. You've got to know these things back and forth and know them second nature because when you get out in the real world, things happen pretty quick. You know, even if you just want to capture a sunrise, the sun crosses its point in the horizon in less than four minutes. And so when you're out there shooting, life is constantly changing. It's constantly speeding by. And as much time as you think you may have, a lot of times things need to get done and you need to know how to work your camera. You need to know what you want to do. And the more you know, the quicker you'll be able to get that great photograph and move on to the next great photograph. Myth number six. Photography is about capturing what I see. And I know this is a bit of a blow for a lot of people because that's why they get into photography. They see interesting things and they want to capture them with the camera. And so we're going to spend some time here. And so let's talk, talk, talk first about your perception versus reality. We're going to look at a number of illustrations here. And the way in which your eyes and your brains work together is a little deceiving. In, he, in this case, you can probably clearly easily make out a white triangle. But as you can clearly see, there is no white triangle. There are other shapes that give the illusion of a white triangle. Your brain puts it together very easily, but there is no white triangle. All right, in this next example, we have perfectly parallel lines. Okay, I can assure you on that. And the lines are not going to change. However, I am going to introduce some blocks in between. And now, if you remember playing the Donkey Kong game, these look like ramps and ladders going up and down to the left. By simply placing these blocks in there at that position, it has confused your brain as to what you are seeing. This next one is a little disorientating. You'll notice when you look at a spot, it looks like the surrounding spots have a different color or a different texture to them. But then when you look to it, it quickly changes. It's a disruptive pattern that does not work well with our eyes and brains. It's confusing. This one is one that still just gets me all the time because here it, it looks like a spiral right to the center of this picture. But in fact, it is not a spiral. Each one of these 
is a complete circle. And it's the disruptive pattern in the background that has thrown you off. And every time I do this, I have to kind of, you know, look at it like this and go, okay, yeah, those are circles. And, okay, now it looks like a spiral again. And so it's, it's the way our brains and our eyes work. You've probably seen this one before. It still gets me. Classic question, which line is larger, the red line or the blue line? And, of course, they are exactly the same size. All right. And so here's a, a new one for you, a little bit of a test here. A number of these colors are identical. A number of these colors are different. Can you tell which ones are the same and the which ones are different? Okay, we're going to do number red first. Make a decision. You don't have to call it out right now, but is it the same or is it different? Different. Red and green. Red, green and green. Different. Blue. Okay, so what am I doing now? Are they the same? Let's do an in-class poll. How many people think this is the same? Any hands? Who thinks it's different? Okay, pretty lots of hands up there think there's a difference. Okay, now we're coming down to the gray one. We're going to do hands in the audience. How many people think these are the same? One, two, three hands. How many people think it's different? One, two, three, four, five. All right, so most people think it's different, and this is identical. All right? What is around an object will affect the way an object appears. And you're going to see that as a big, big view here. So this one is going to freak you out, and you're going to have to pay really close attention if you want it to freak you out. And it freaks you out in a good way. Okay, so I'm going to put some colors up here, and I'm going to put a white dot up, and I want you to stare at the white dot. Okay, so start staring at the white dot. Don't move. Don't change. Just keep looking at the white dot like just kill for a few seconds at a time. What I'm going to do is you're going to continue looking at this white dot. I'm going to move the dot down, and you're going to be seeing these two birds, great blue herons, kind of in the peripheral of your vision. Okay, you're staring at the white dot. Here we go. Move down there. Stay down there. Locked on the white dot. Notice the color changing of the pictures. How many people in here in the classroom are seeing color changes? Raise your hands. Okay. Now look away and then look back at those pictures and you'll notice that those pictures are identical. They're just mirror images of those. And this is just funky stuff our brain does. And I, I love these things. I think they're just cool. You know, I look at this, and I absolutely see that the top green and the bottom green are different shades, but when we take them across, they're identical. And it's this whole concept of an object is affected by its surroundings. And we're not even going to get into the philosophical <laughs> question about how that affects people in our real lives. And here's where we uh, start, start getting closer to photography. Okay, this is a middle gray strip with a black background. Keep your eyes on the gray strip, and I'm going to change the background to white. What happens to the gray stripe? It appears to get darker because of the light background. An object is affected by how bright and how dark the background is around it. When we add a gradient behind that same gray stripe, that even gray stripe appears lighter on the left and darker on the right. But I haven't played any games with you here, folks. That is an absolutely true middle gray stripe across the board. All right, just a couple more here. All right, so we have a white block and a black background. I don't think I should have too much disagreement on that. But if I introduce a truly white block and a black background, you'll see that I was just joking with you earlier on. And if I introduce yet another more truly white block, you'll see that I was once again lying. And I could do that again and again. And you think back to that first time when I said there was a white block there, it appeared white because you didn't have anything else to compare it to. So what is lighter? What is darker? A and B. Take a look at them. And they are, of course, identical. Objects are affected by their surroundings. And when we do this same test with color, look at how much more saturated that color is in what appears to be the shadow. And we'll go ahead and swap those really slowly so you can see that they're exactly the same tone. We'll let them kind of affix into their new position. And you can see that extra saturation because it's, around, it's surrounded by a darker environment. So I hope you can start to see now that this photography is about capturing what I see is going to be a little bit hard.
You can't photograph all that you see. That's, that's the thing. And this was a rather difficult list for me to come up with, but I now have a list for you. And this is a list of things that you can see with your eyes, but you can't photograph. All right, so don't bother bringing your camera out for the following situations. All right, sorry to say this. Number one, motion. All right, there's something very particular about motion that doesn't work too well. And if we think about motion like Michael Jackson's Moonwalk, one of my favorite motion events, a dance event, imagine trying to capture that in a still photograph. Dance is a very fluid event. It's like a lot of sports, human action. Here's, here's his best moonwalk ever, right there. All right? Looks great on video. Video is a great way, and video is an amazing technical tool. And as Chase said, we're, our cameras are getting into it. But this class in particular is not about video. It's about still photographs. And imagine if this is all you had to explain what the moonwalk was. This would not do a very good job with a moonwalk. And so this is a case where motion is not well captured by a still photograph. There are a variety of tools and techniques that we have to help study motion in still photography, a multi-strobe effect, but it doesn't really capture that fluid movement. This is a picture I took in Kenya, Africa, and I was quite excited about it, and probably nobody here can tell me why they were excited. Is, is there any guesses in the classroom as to why I was like, ooh, this is going to be an extra cool shot because of? The, the layers moving. of colors. Layers of colors. What else? Clouds. The clouds moving. Nope. This ostrich was running <laughs> through the field. And it looked cool to my eye. I could see it there, and I don't have any other pictures of wild ostriches in Kenya, and I thought it was cool. But that subtle little movement is something I could pick up with my eye that just did not pick up on the camera. All right, next one. Three-dimensional versus two-dimensional. We see things in three dimensions. We're looking with two eyes. We can judge distance away from us. And it's very exciting being a in a dynamic environment where people are close to you and they're far away from you. And you have this experience of changing focus from close up to far away. And you don't get that with a photograph because everything comes down to two dimension. It's on a flat plane. And you don't get that three-dimensional feeling. One of the clear areas is when it's snowing. Think about that experience of walking outside and you have snow falling on the tip of your nose and it's falling in the horizon. And as you change focus, it's all in focus. It's an exciting dynamic environment. And it's my theory why kids and dogs get really excited out in snow. Think how excited they get. It's because there's all this action. There's all this motion. And it, the problem is, is it just doesn't capture well in a still photograph. Next up, extreme contrast. Our eyes have an amazing ability to see things in the dark as well as see things in a very bright environment. And our eyes adjust very, very quickly for this. Now, I could see when I was climbing Mount Rainier very easily my climbing partner's coat, what color it was but I couldn't photograph it and the sunrise at the same time. There is a limited contrast range that we can work with in photography, and there are some ways to play around with this, and we will get into those special examples, but for the most part, it's tough dealing with extreme contrast. I was in Australia, and there's some amazing Aboriginal artwork on the inside of a cave, but I was trying to capture the environment outside, so I had to take two photographs, and I'll explain on how you can work these together to combine the best of both of these. But I had to take two s completely separate photographs to capture the two different elements of what was going on. Another one is low light motion. This is kind of like the other motion, but our eyes are pretty darn good at seeing things in low light. Think how well you can navigate your own home with hardly any lights on. Maybe just a little bit of moonlight coming in through a window. You can find your way around the tables and chairs and so forth so that you don't bump your knees. But we have a very difficult time, as good as cameras are, and I know there's some really cool cameras out with high ISOs, but it's limiting. Uh, here in South Georgia Island, I'm sorry to say there are no ghost penguins. These are penguins that were just moving around, and I had to use a really long shutter speed to get a shot of any need. And so when you're caught with situations where there's low light, it's going to be tough to get a good shot. We need reasonable light. It's getting less and less so all the time with better technology. 
And so you're going to end up with a lot of this blurry motion under low light conditions. It's just the way it is. I'll have to admit this one is not going to affect a lot of people tremendously, but it's something to know. There are colors that cannot be represented by our computer monitors, by our printers, and by our digital projectors. A fluorescent sign doesn't really look as fluorescent as it does in real life. A neon foosball table under a black light does not have the same glow that it does have in real life. These colors are outside the gamut range that we can see. Once again, our eyes have a very large visible spectrum, and what we can see with our cameras right in here is going to be quite a bit less. It's getting better all the time. Maybe someday it will be able to match our human eyesight. But for quite some time, I think it's going to be a little bit limited on those extreme colors. All right? Think about your eyeball. It has a curved cornea and a curved retina. And this is actually a perfect viewing system. It's an amazing optical device. The cameras that we have, well, the lenses are curved. But as you know, that sensor or the film is a flat film plane. And this has some problems when you get out in the field. When you photograph a structure straight on, it looks just fine. But when you get off to the side, it starts looking a little bit more and more awkward. And we know that these are parallel lines running up and down this building, but in the photograph, they do not appear that way. Now, there are some ways you can fix that in the field with special equipment, and there are some uh, tips that you, tricks that you can do in Photoshop and I'll talk a little bit about those. This is the same problem that we have with the projection of a map on the planet. It's hard to take a spherical surface and project it onto a flat surface and make it correct. And the real problem in the world is when you start putting someone's head in the corner of a photograph of a wide-angle lens, it starts looking like an egg, and that's not a nice thing to do to one of your friends. But probably the biggest thing that you need to watch out for is your brain filter. And this is where you think you saw something, but you didn't see it. When I took this uh, picture of a whale up in Alaska, Glacier Bay, Alaska, I was downloading the image and I said, oh, this is going to be the coolest shot of a whale breaching. It, it practically soaked me with water because it was so close. Well, it was like a half mile away and I had the biggest telephoto lens I could get on it. You know, it was filling... Not the frame, it was filling the brackets of my focusing, uh, my focus brackets. It wasn't nearly as close as I remember it. We often make, make things into what we thought we saw. It isn't what they really saw. And so sometimes you really have to look at the four corners of your frame and go, am I filling the frame with what's of interest? You know, this picture took a tremendous amount of effort to make. And the, mat the fact of the matter is, is it sucks. I hiked for hours and hours and hours. This is the northernmost point, essentially, of the Rockies, looking out onto the Arctic Ocean. And you've seen those famous uh, shots, they're usually time-lapse shots, of the sun dipping down low to the horizon but not quite hitting the horizon and coming back up. I wanted to shoot that. And me and a buddy, we hiked up in this extraordinarily remote region. We were battling mosquitoes and all sorts of things. We went through all this effort, and it was cloudy all night long, and we weren't able to get the shot. And emotionally, we had invested so much time and effort into it. I still look at it, and I remember the moment, but nothing, nothing came of it. And so at, at these times, you just have to say, it was a nice try, but it didn't work out. So as I, as I say, I'm sorry you cannot photograph everything that you see. But the, the flip side of the coin is that you can photograph more than you can see. And this is not why you, get into for, why you get into photography, but it's one of the reasons why you might stay in photography. Now, these are some devices that we've come up with that enable us to see things that we can't see with our own eyes. But your everyday, ordinary camera can do the same as well. And so we're going to look at a list of things that you can't see with your own eyes, but you can photograph. All right? We'll start with this, uh, this one. Freezing action. Now, you can, of course, see a horse riding through water but you could by no means count the water droplets in the air. With any camera, by setting a fast shutter speed, you can capture something that is unique to the human experience. And that, in and of its own, kind of adds an element to make your photograph more interesting 
and more dynamic. When you can take that moment in time and you can hold it and you can really steady it. Freezing that action. And so there's some really fun stuff that you can do with very high shutter speeds, freezing a drop of water, dropping into a bottle. Now we can't capture Michael Jackson's moonwalk and still photographs very well, but we can take other types of motion, a river flowing. We can use a long shutter speed and we can render it in a way that is different than the way any human has ever seen a, a waterfall. No human has ever looked at a waterfall and seen this. But I'm sure that all of you get it, you understand that water's flowing, and it adds an artistic element to that type of photograph. And so it's a great technique that you can use for all sorts of subjects by using slow shutters. And it's, it's often fun because you don't know what you're going to get. It's often a little bit of a surprise. It's a little bit of a gamble. You get a feel for it. And with the current crop of digital cameras where you can see the results pretty quickly, you're able to get these more easily now than ever before. Most people don't think about it, but you do have a certain amount of depth of field that you see with your own eyes. And cameras will allow you to greatly control that on your own. You can choose to have great depth of field and render everything in focus, or you could have very shallow depth of field to narrow your viewer's attention into one particular area. And in the field, it's a great technique to use because you can completely change the way a scene looks without moving the tripod or the camera a millimeter. We are somewhat limited with our vision. We are only given one set of eyes. They only have one magnification ratio. And if you want to see something closer, using a telephoto lens might get you closer than you would ever see it in your own life. A wild bird in Peru, you're just not going to get that close to out in the wild. Telephoto lens is a great tool to have. See, you can see closer than you could ever see with your own eyes. With that telephoto lens, you can also have another little trick up your sleeve with compression, taking two objects that are relatively far apart, but you photograph them from the right angle with the right lens, and it looks like they're right on top of each other. And this is a fun technique to use. Use this when I was riding my bike up in Alaska. I wanted to show how close I was to Denali. I might have been like 100 miles away, but I used a 400 millimeter lens to compress the distance to render a feeling that I wanted to sh have with that photograph. And so this is a technique that I will commonly use, and it's a very good technique. There's Art Wolf filming an episode of Travels to the Edge. And with a wide-angle lens, you can do just the opposite, expansion. I'm not a very good rock climber, and my buddy is marginally better than I am. But down at Smith Rocks in uh, Oregon, we found this one area where he could climb out on the rocks, and it looked like he was in the middle of El Capitan. And in reality, he's clipped in, and it's just kind of a little bit faky trickery, photographic trickery. Uh, but it's one of those things that you can use to your advantage if you want to show things in a certain way. When you want to really expand the horizon and show how large an area is, the wide-angle lens is a very powerful tool to use. And it's the type of tool that I always want to have with me when I'm out shooting. The world of black and white photography is a great corner of the photographic community. There's a lot of neat stuff that is best rendered into black and white. And unfortunately, in some ways, it's just a trick. It's not the way we see the world unless you are colorblind. It's a way of rendering your subject in a more simple form. And it works very well for telling the story of certain types of images. And I like using black and white from time to time. Uh, some of these examples in here are actually shot with a digital camera using a very dark red filter, an infrared filter that gives the feeling of an infrared, even though the camera itself is not infrared. So it renders vegetation with a very different look. And so this can be a fun and different type of photography that you can get into. And some subjects, just come off looking really good in black and white. And there are some people who specialize in it. You can dabble in it. And the fantastic thing about the modern world of digital photography is that you can shoot it in color, you can render it in black and white, and you can go back to color. And you don't have to choose when you leave your house as to what you're going to shoot that day. You can decide later. And one of the neat things is that you can view black and white in the back of most of your cameras now so that you can see it out in the, out in the field 
what you're getting, but still record the full true image that you'll get in color and black and white. And of course, when you get into the world of Photoshop and digital manipulation, you can create images that you might not ever be able to, to create. Now, this is an actual photograph of the stars that I took from eastern Washington. It's a stock image of the planet Earth, and I compiled this in Photoshop. It's not that big a trick. And the neat thing to me is that I know that this image exists somewhere. If I, if I only had access to getting out there, I would take the picture in reality, but I'll never get there. But the nice thing to know is that somewhere it looks exactly like this. And it is, it is reality, but I've been able to fake my way to reality. And so sometimes, you know, this is a Photoshopped image of a canoe trip I had up in Canada. And I didn't really change it fundamentally that much. There was a boom holding the camera, and I just simply took it out of the shot. It was a cover shot for a, a small documentary, and I didn't feel that the shadow needed to be in the shot, but I wanted to use it otherwise. So it's a great tool to use, and I do have Photoshop and like it very much. Another fun little area of photography is macro photography. And there is a whole world basically at your footstep if you're willing to investigate and take the time to get down on your hands and knees and take a look at this world that we sometimes don't always pay a lot of attention to. Uh, sometimes when it's not a great day for taking pictures in other ways, the macro world can open you up and keep you completely busy and you've hardly moved 10 or 20 feet. And so I have a macro lens, I have extension tubes, and we'll get into those at a certain point talking about how to do close-up photography. But it's a great and wonderful world of things that you don't normally see with your eyes on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll talk about filters. And there are filters, and many of you have polarized lenses on your sunglasses, and polarizing glasses help reduce reflection. This is what polarizers do. We'll talk about this when we talk about filters. And so reducing reflections isn't how we see things with our own eyes. It's kind of beyond our own vision capabilities, but they're simple tools that can help us in a variety of situations. Here is a park in West Seattle without a polarizer, and now I put on a polarizer and look at the difference in the photograph. It really brings out the lush vegetation, and I'll explain clearly when we get to that section about how to use polarizers for maximum effect. One of the new things in my class is that I talk about cropping an image. I had a nasty photographer in my way. Art Wolf was standing in front of me during this shot, and I wanted to crop him out, so I got the image over on the right. And so, you know, you can crop something out, and nobody knows the better unless you let them know like I just did. <laughs> and so, you know, here is a, a beautiful beach. I love this scene here, but there was actually a whole bunch of junk on the beach that I didn't have time to clean up, and so I just cropped it out later on. And it looks a lot nicer like this, and this is how I would like to remember it. And so cropping is a great tool, and I do have a fun section on cropping on, to get the most out of your images later on. Now, while we can't photograph those penguins moving around in low light, we do have tremendous ability in low light to capture other types of scene. This is a baobab tree in Madagascar, uh, taken with about a 45-second exposure. When you can leave the shutter on your camera open for 15 seconds or 30 seconds or 45 seconds, you can start to pick up things in your camera that you can't see with your own eyes. And w once again, this is kind of like that blur photography where you don't know exactly what you're going to get. You have an idea, you have hopes, and sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't, sometimes you get more than you hope for. And so nighttime photography is one of my favorite areas of photography because it is it has that level of unpredictability. From Monterey down in California, those are not clouds, those are waves crashing up on the rocks over a 30 second exposure. Another great thing about photography is that cameras are pretty small. You can put them in a lot of unusual and cool places, places that you might not want to go yourself. And so you could hide it in the crevasse uh, in, this, in this instance and I could have my buddy jump over it. So you can mount cameras in unusual places. And we'll talk at length when we get to the section on composition about using unique perspective and unique angles to show subjects in a different way. But when it really comes down to it, what photography is all about, the real key to great photography is pretty simple. It's the moment. It's finding the right moment 
for a given situation. Maybe it's the perfectly right moment, or maybe it's the perfectly wrong moment, but it's when everything that you have seen has really lined up the way you want it to. It's the way you want to remember that moment in time. Now, this is it's kind of a funny story. I was in India, Varanasi, India. It's a very, very crowded street, and just having a couple of pictures helps tell this story. Uh, what's going on here is that it's a religious holiday. It's a, I believe it's a Hindu festival, and there's a bunch of kids who've skipped school, and they have put together a float that you can see over here on the left, and they've put their stereos together, and they've mounted up a bunch of speakers, and they've, um, they're going through the city streets playing music at full blast while kids are dancing and throwing things out in the crowd with this little float. Now, to power this, you know, this is, this is being taken around by bicycles, basically. To power this, you'll see there's a power cord running down here to an engine, okay? Now, like with any group of friends, there's a bit of a hierarchy as, you know, who's the coolest kid of the group and who's the youngest and doesn't, you know, doesn't get the nice stuff. And so, you know, I'm sure some of the, the, the medium-high kids were over here on the float, just, you know, getting pushed around. The cool kids were, of course, back here in the DJ booth. You know, they get to play the music they want to play. And maybe the lowest guy on the list is the guy pushing the engine bicycle. But in fact, in my opinion, I don't think he's the lowest guy on the list. The lowest guy on the list is the guy pushing the speaker bike (laughs) right in front of all those speakers going full blast. (laughs) You push the bike with the speakers on it. And so this is where photography is good. It allows you to kind of stop, stop time, tell your little story. And I've had a great opportunity traveling with Art Wolf to the most fantastic locations around the planet. And there are just moments in time that you do want to cherish forever. Times where things are just absolutely perfect. And photography is the perfect key for capturing those key moments. And with the size of cameras, the quality of digital cameras, it's not that hard to do It's not that much equipment. It's a little bag, it's a little bit of knowledge, and it's using all your experiences to really piece everything together for one moment. And I love traveling, I love photography because you constantly are being shown new things and you're you're tasked with trying to figure it out. How do I capture the best image in this particular moment? Understanding your cameras is just simply the first step. It's then understanding the situation you're in and everything that you can about about it. And so waiting for the moment, knowing when it's there is what photography is really all about.